Hello and welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to the Frederick African Arts Day. We are happy to have you all here. And uh, we are going to listen to our keynote speaker, Nicole Bridges, coming up soon. But first, I would like to say a few words before we get started. We are so excited to have you join us at this event that has been made possible by the Central Minnesota Arts Board through a grant. This activity is made possible by the voters of Minnesota through a grant from the Central Minnesota Arts Board and thanks to a legislative appropriation from the Arts and the Cultural Heritage Fund. We have had additional support for this event too and it has come from the Bui Family Union, which is a national organization of the Bui people resident in the United States. Uh, we have also had support from the Central Minnesota Sustainability Project, the Granite City Folk Society, Arts in Action, Simonia Consulting, with the Bali, the African Women's Alliance, and we also have support from these strategic partners, the City of St. Cloud, the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, and St. Louis Museum of Arts, represented here today by Nicole Bridges. And we also have a lot of in-kind support from other uh, members of the community, as well as uh, Bernie's Pepsi. And to all of our supporters, we say thank you. To our friends, teachers here from St. Cloud, and to our presenters and performers who answered the call to be here today, thank you so much. We are also especially grateful to our uh, key partner, Kui Family Union, who is, which is present here and presented by the President, Mr. Black, Mr. Lucy Tassin, all the way from uh, North Carolina. And uh, we also have Gideon, who will be coming in from uh, Georgia. And there's a core team planning who uh, has helped us put this together, Christina Seaborn, uh, Ashley Froming, and myself, we have, uh, you know, kind of been in the background doing another thing, so we hope you enjoy what you're going to see here today. So at this point, we are going to have you welcome our keynote speaker, Nicole Bridges, who will be telling us about the St. Louis Museum of Art and what they have there in their galleries. And my name again is Jeanette Yaran, I'm the assistant and the director for this project. Thank you very much. Take it away. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Nicole Bridges, and I work at the St. Louis Art Museum, where I'm the museum's curator for Art from Africa. And I also head up all of the non-European non and non-Asian collections. So um, I oversee uh, Ancient America, art from the Ancient Americas, art from Native North America, and uh, Oceania, the Pacific Islands. Um, so I'd like to thank um, Jeanette for inviting me and uh, the whole team uh, at the f helping with the festival today and at the foundation. It's been really interesting to learn a little bit more about the foundation and Mr. Yuran uh, when I shared news with my colleague, the head of education at the St. Louis Art Museum, she came from Minneapolis and she said, oh, I know Fred, I know Fred. So um, I understand that he was a very important art educator and I think it's really neat that so many organizations um, in the region and across the state are funding this, this foundation and its mission. It's, it's really cool. <laughs> um, so I'm going to just provide an overview today of what we have in our collection and what we're doing in our galleries. If you were to visit the St. Louis Art Museum today, you would find our African art galleries closed. Um, I've been at the museum for five years and um, I'm finally getting to make some changes that I've been wanting to make. Um, things move a bit slowly in art museums, I don't know if you know that, but um, you know, um, so our galleries are closed at the moment, and I'm going to provide kind of an, an introduction to what, what the kind of new approach that uh, I'll be taking in those new galleries. Um, for those of you who haven't visited St. Louis, um, the St. Louis Art Museum is an encyclopedic art museum. We have art from around the world, from across time, um, from ancient history until the present day. Uh, we were established in 1879. This is our beautiful building with the, the recently constructed building on the far left of the screen. Uh, that, op that new building opened in 2013. And since we're talking about Africa at large today, um, 
Mia will be hosting an, an exhibition called Sunken Cities, uh, which is an ancient Egyptian show, and we have that show right now, and it's been um, really popular. It has some amazingly beautiful things, and I hope that you'll make a point of seeing it when it gets to Mia uh, in, in just a few months. So, St. Louis has been, we've been collecting African art since 1936. This was our first acquisition. Um, why did these art museums start collecting African art? Actually, SLAM, St. Louis, we claim a very early collecting date for bringing in African art into this collection. We didn't bring it in as anthropology, we are an art museum. So uh, we brought in this work in 1936, which is pretty early. And just for a frame of reference, the Metropolitan Museum of Art did not have a collection of African art until 1978, when it acquired full part and parcel from Nelson Rockefeller, and then established those galleries in 1982. So just to show you that you know, we, we can take for granted today in an encyclopedic museum that African art is in, is in the building, uh, but it hasn't always been. But from very early on in St. Louis's history, uh, we, we were collecting, and we were collecting seriously. This was a home run for us. <laughs> this is the masterpiece, one of the masterpieces of our Sub-Saharan African collection. It's a, um, a fifth, it has a wide date range. Uh, this has been contested 15th to 18th century um, from the Kingdom of Benin. So why did the St. Louis Art Museum take an interest in collecting African art? Well, we're an encyclopedic art museum. Yes, so of course we want to represent the best from around the world. But two, what was happening in the 1930s in the United States and in Europe in modern art? Modernism. And these modernist artists were looking at African art for inspiration to really transform the course of modern European and American art as we knew it. Moving, looking at African and Oceanic art and other um, non-European arts for inspiration uh, to move into abstraction. And so on the right, I'm just showing you a painting by Fernand Leger uh, from 1932. And then maybe the most famous is probably this Picasso um, from 1907, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, which is kind of the textbook example of, um, <laughs> of how modernist European artists were really appropriating African art, historical African art, for, uh, to transform their own work. So um, we continued on into the 1940s to collect um, another handful of works that you see on the screen here, mostly from Central Africa. Um, we'll see these objects again, so I won't speak specifically about them. Uh, but our collection really grew thanks to one individual, uh, this individual here on the screen, Morton D. May. He was the, the chief executive owner of the May Company department stores. These had different iterations across the country. Um, they were called Famous Bar or um, Kaufman's in the uh, Cleveland and Pittsburgh area. Um, Hex in the Washington DC area, anyway. So he was a voracious collector of art. He collected not only African art, but Oceanic, Ancient American art, and modern European art. Um, so most of our, most of the collections that I manage at the St. Louis Art Museum, um, the core of that collection comes from him, and uh, as well as some of our modern European collections, the, that core comes from him as well. So he really collected en encyclopedically. So he provided us with some of, again, with some of the most important works in our collection. So um, here we have masks and sculpture from Central Africa, um, coming in gifts that came in in the 1960s. These are just selections. Um, masks and sculpture from West, again, West Africa here, Central Africa, and I'll get to these objects again specifically. Um, today our collection of Af Sub-Saharan African art numbers about 1,200 objects. 
um, half of which are, are miniature gold weights. So <laughs> um, just to provide some, some scale. Again, gifts from the 1980s. Uh, these are terracotta sculptures from the left that we'll see and from Ghana. Beautiful Cuba mask on the right. And these are some of the miniature sculptures that miniature gold weights and um, other metal works from West Africa. So today our collection, uh, like I said, it numbers about uh, 1,200 objects, half of which are very small <laughs> things. Um, and on view at any given time in our permanent galleries, we have maybe 80 objects, 80 artworks out on view. So we don't have the space you know, to, all, you know, most art museums don't have the space to display everything in the collection. So to reintroduce uh, the collection to our visitors in St. Louis, I'm, I'm, I'm asking our visitors to think about some themes about concerning what we're seeing and what, we're, what we don't see in the African art galleries and the art museum. So the first theme that our visitors will encounter is something called spectacular fragments. And this really addresses the fact that, you know, I'm sorry that the drum stopped because <laughs> when you walk into an art museum and you see the works on display, a mask, a sculpture, a textile, a terracotta pot, Whatever it is, it is incomplete. It is woefully incomplete. These works on the screen and that you encounter in the galleries had beautiful, rich context that we, we simply are missing. A mask is incomplete without its costume, its full body costume, its performer, the musicians who accompanied it in performance, the audience of participants and dancers who accompanied it and celebrated it and egged it on while it was performing. The sight, sound, smell, all of this, these are missing. So, like I said, we're in an art museum. And so, in the art museum, across all of the galleries, we show works as individual works of art. We want people to appreciate them for their artistic form, which is wonderful, for their sculptural form. And these are exceptional sculptures. And that's how we display them. And we want to encourage our visitors to appreciate the remarkable artistic skill and accomplishment that these artists have achieved in these works of art. And so that is our focus. But I am asking our visitors to, to acknowledge that, you know, this is great but it was so much greater. <laughs> um, has, uh, you know, there's nothing like being, you know, there's nothing like witnessing um, a, mas a masquerade or performance in Africa. You can't replicate it. Um, so something that we attempt to do, you know, we try to uh, present some contextual images where we have documentation from scholars in the field who have done research in the areas that our collection represents. So we have our, our wonderful Baga Dimba mask from Guinea. And um, we're actually, I'm pulling this one out. It had been in a, we have a lot of case work in the galleries and I'm pulling this one out um, so that it's on a platform. And I, again, I have, I'm sorry I don't have gallery photos to show you because it's not, hasn't happened yet. <laughs> Um, so this, this mask is, um, the dimensions are there, it's about, um, it's uh, five feet tall, and you can see how it was worn, oh, I don't have, the pointer's not working, so you can see how the mask was worn over the dancer's shoulders and head, so the head actually sat on top, that so gives you, so the image gives us, a, gives our visitors a little bit of a sense of the scale. And this is a mask that represents a great mother, um, a mature mother of 
So the, you know, these pendant breasts that you see suggest that she has nurtured children in the past. Um, and so she comes out of ver at various celebrations and harvests. Uh, again, so, you know, we have all of these wonderful masks, minimal context, but beautiful sculpture. <laughs> These plank masks, you know, these are masks with superstructures. So those vertical um, panels that extend from the top are, you know, extending above. And so here you see, this is your mask from Bur Burkina Faso. Here we see the performers wearing the masks and, and seeing those structures soar into the sky. Well, you know, we have a ceiling height <laughs> in our galleries. So we have to display those masks with the face down below if we want to display them at all. And so that's what we do. That's the compromise that we make. So these galleries really are one of, they're galleries of compromise <laughs> in so many ways, which is the art of working in an art museum, actually. <laughs> um, so we have these um, Akan terracotta heads, and I, I felt like I heard a, a sound of recognition earlier. Um, these are memorial heads. They were placed uh, in groves on the edge of cemeteries, and they are considered portraits. So while they are idealized representations, they are, were still very much understood to embody the character and essence of the individual that they memorialized. And um, as you can see, they have these very peaceful, um, kind of wise expressions on their faces. And they're, they're really just beautiful, beautiful sculptures. Um, so that's the end of the kind of spectacular fragment section. Are, I can take maybe one or two questions if there are any about any of the works or any of the points that have come up. Yeah, Rick. I'm just curious about the, the, the little gold weights that you talked about. Uh -huh. I assume these are little weights that would be set on one side of the scale and something else on the other side? Is that the way they were used? Gold, yeah, not? so the gold, they're, we, they're gold weights in the sense that they were, so they're made of brass, but they were used as counterweights to measuring gold. So those are miniature sculptures from Ghana uh, which was known as the Gold Coast, which you know had a very important has today and produces still um, a significant amount of gold on the world market. And the kingdoms a in Ghana, uh, principally the Asante Kingdom, but others as well, smaller uh, chiefdoms in Fante, La Fante Land and elsewhere. Um, Gold was traded extensively um, through North African trade, but also through the transatlantic trade. Um, this was an important source of the great Asante Kingdom's wealth today, uh, is, it was gold. So these, fig these little, um, yeah, those, that's what they were used for. Okay. Any other questions before we move on? Okay. Oh, yes. African art has been used as an inspiration. Say as an inspiration by to European arts in the body So could you explain to us how African arts is used inspirationally? Yeah, sure. Um, let me go back to just to have an image on the screen. Um, so this is this is a movement that's widely acknowledged uh, in art historical studies that modern art, modern European and American artists at the beginning of the 20th century were looking to historical African art, historical oceanic art, histor ancient American art, native North American art. They were looking toward art from other ethnicities and other civilizations for inspiration for their own art. So before 1900, basically European art, I don't have any images because <laughs> that's not what I'm talking about today. 
European art was focused on representation and naturalism. But in, at the beginning of the 20th century, artists like Picasso, Leger, Matisse, others, moved European art into abstraction. And what helped them get there, that's a very abstract image, what helped them get there was their looking at all of these non-European arts, which were coming in thanks to colonial contact. Um, and so in Paris, which still today has the, you know, has the mo one of the most, has the most active market in historical African art, um, those museums were starting to display museums and galleries and curiosity shops were displaying these artworks from Africa that were coming in through colonial contact, through missionaries, through explorers, through colonial workers. Uh, and they were encountering and collecting these artworks. And um, actually there's an exhibition right now, it, it left Kansas City, it's now in Montreal, it's called, it's had a few different names, so I don't know what it's called anymore. But it's, um, it's, it's all about Picasso and his encounter with African and Oceanic art and how it inspired his artwork. Some say inspired, some say appropriation, right? Depends on which, uh, which angle you're approaching it from. It's, it's both, right? The next section, or the next kind of issue that I'm asking our visitors in St. Louis to do is to think about these works in terms of historical context. I think that there's a tendency in um, kind of when we're looking at traditions-based and historical African art like this, there's a tendency to sort of not know where in history we are, right? And I, I think that applies often to kind of American conception, American and European conceptions of Africa. Like we just, it can be sort of unfamiliar to common audiences. And so it doesn't kind of, doesn't really register <laughs> like chronologically. And so I'm really asking our visitors to um, understand where these works fall in time and in the scope of uh, global art history as well. So this, this object that you see on the screen, this is a, our knock terracotta head. It's the oldest work that we have in our sub-Saharan collection. It dates from 500 to two, 500 BC to 200 uh, of this era. But of course, in the scheme of things, it's pretty new. <laughs> when you think about Sub-Saharan African art, Sub-Saharan African art actually dates as far back as the rock paintings and engravings that from Southern Africa that date 25,000 years ago. Right? We don't have those in our collection, <laughs> thankfully. They're where they should be. Um, so I, you know, I, in a text panel, I sort of ask, I kind of mention those. But then moving on a little, for, little more forward in time, uh, we have our, our lovely kneeling Jene terracotta from Mali, um, which dates about 13th to 15th century. And our suite of uh, Benin bronzes uh, that range in date from um, the 15th to 18th centuries. So um, those are kind of, that moves us through kind of like the early modern period. Um, we have one example of a, a, a late 17th century small Ethiopian um, Christian pendant. And so that also encourages our visitors to think about Africa's place in the world and how long Africa. Africa's been interacting with, you know, the globe since ancient, you know, the days of ancient Greece. And so I think I put this in at the, in the front end of our first gallery that our visitors encounter. Um, and I think it surprises people because it could very easily fit into our European, um, our early European art collections. Um, but here, this is a reminder to our visitors that Christianity has, in Ethiopia has been 
Christianity has been in Ethiopia since the fourth century. And, um, you know, this distinctive kind of the style of um, St. George and uh, Mary and Jesus, this, this is actually influenced by um, Italian, Baroque, a, a Baroque Italian source. Um, although Ethiopians are, Ethiopian Christians are practiced Coptic Christianity, there was a brief period in the, in the 17th and 18th century when Franciscans were there and they brought the source for this imagery with them. And so this is the Mary, and this is sort of the practice that continued on, even after the Franciscans were gone. Um, that does not reproduce well here, unfortunately. Um, a Dogon a double figure here. We have a female figure standing atop a male figure. That dates from about 1640 to 1810. It's been carbon dated. Um, and then we have some Central African reliquary figures. We call them reliquary figures, but they are missing the relics. So again, the fragmentary nature of the, of the works that we have in our galleries. I'm glad we don't have the relics. We, would prob we, wouldn't prob we probably would not display it if we did. Um, are you familiar with this genre of work? So these are from Gabon, from Central Africa. Uh, this is particular example is Kota. These are people that live around the Ogoe River. And in the past, they preserved the skulls of the most important ancestors and placed them in baskets that were adorned and protected by, this, by sculptures like this. And so on the right, you see a rendering by the French explorer de Braza um, that, sh that shows these basket containers that the sculptures sat on top. And so, you know, it was really only the most important ancestors that received this treatment. It, it, it was, you know, Aunt Eleanor, the mother of twins, the wisest from you know, know, and sought after for miles away, uncle so and so, the wisest chief, and, and so it was. It wasn't just anybody who was was treated this way. And so those ancestors, the skulls were preserved. They were set in an enclosure near the near the family compound, but aside from it. And periodically, um, the initiated elder men of the community of the family would visit those relics and acknowledge them, speak to them, sing, sometimes cradle them. Uh, but it's the sculptures that we have that attest to this history. These practices don't really continue, um, as far as we know today, in Gabon. Um, as you know, um, colonial, colonialism and missionary activity discouraged the use, or in some cases outlawed um, the, the continuations of traditional religious practices. And so um, these sculptures, the visible aspects of this practice really went away. And so the sculptures are not made anymore today. Um, Kota and Fang people who have converted to Christianity, however, they do still bury their family members within proximity to the house. And so there's that continued access and connection always with the, with the ancestors and the ancestral realm. So the next section addresses a, a handful of artworks that are comprised of mixed matter. Power, and this matter is considered powerful. And these works are not the result of a single hand. They result from a collaboration between an artist, a ritual specialist, and a, and a client. Um, ritual specialists, um, these are individuals who have special training. And you know, from a Western perspective, it's he or she is sort of 
the cross between like your therapist, your priest, and your your um, homeopathic um, medicinal expert. Um, so this work is a, an Nkisi and Kandi from the Lower Congo. This is the area where I did my field, my research. Uh, for a year in 2007, and the Nganga, the ritual specialist that I work with, is a woman, and uh, she did not use, well again, these figurative power figures don't exist anymore, but there are still, there is still a continuation of power objects in Kisi uh, that people carry as bundles that they tuck into their pocket or tie around their arm, um, and this is comprised, you know, those bundles are comprised of medis herbs or minerals and other m matter that the Nganga has specially concocted for the client's needs. So this is a uh, Nkisi and Conde. It's um, from the lower Congo area, just around the mouth of the Congo River on the, at the Atlantic coast. And it was the property of the ritual specialist of the Nganga. And the Nganga, you know, worked with the sculptor to, you know, to create the sculpture, but then the Nganga activated it. It's, otherwise it was just kind of an inert piece of wood. <laughs> so the nails and blades that you see signify a particular case, particular client, uh, a resolution or activation. And the mirror in the front, the he has this box on his belly that contained the healing matter. Uh, he's missing a mud-packed bundle on his head that probably contained herbal medicinal matter. The eyes are made of uh, porcelain, imported porcelain from Europe. And um, he would have worn, he had a skirt that has gone missing. And he's related to a body of objects called Nkisi. This is another one from the same area. This is a very small one. And he, this one is actually a whistle. Uh, that, so it may have belonged to a hunter uh, who used it for assistance in, hunt, in, a, in a successful hunt. Or it could have also belonged to an Nganga who is sometimes described as a hunter who seeks out the, the healing powers. Uh, this is another in Kishi, but not from Lower Congo. He's, this one is from further, this is Songe, from further east and south in Congo. And this is a Fan Bocio. Um, this is related to the, the Bodun religion in Benin. And it also is a receptacle for powerful matter um, that enhances the sculptor's ability to um, to draw influence and to connect with the ancestors and their healing powers. This is a divination power object um, from Liberia, Kis made by Kisi artists. And this one we had x-rayed and it is containing iron, iron pieces that were historically used as currency. So again, power, more power, power contents. The next section is devoted to royal arts, arts from African kingdoms. And an angle that I take on that is, or that I encourage our visitors to think about is the exchange of materials and motifs coming from kind of global sources. So bronze, the way, one of the ways that African, that historians of African art date Benin bronzes is by their thickness. And so the oldest example on the far left, he's cast very thinly through the lost wax. They're all lost wax casting technique. The example on the far left is the oldest, and he's cast so thinly. It's remarkable that he is, that he has such integrity, structural integrity. It's just, it's 
like an eggshell. It's beautiful. But then as we move on in time, they get thicker. Why is that? So 15th, 16th century, this is very early on in contact with Portuguese. Portuguese arrived along the coast of the Atlantic, the, uh, Africa's Atlantic coast, the end of the towards the end of the 15th century, and with them they brought these currency, these objects of trade called Manilas, which were these bronze rods. And so, as they were, as trade increased with the Portuguese, the kingdom's supply of this bronze increased as the slave trade increased and the Benin kingdoms benefit, you know, benef continued to benefit from that trade. The content of the bronze, the thickness of the casting, it is embodied, this history is embodied in these objects. So the, the second commemorative head in the middle is like it's cast very thickly. It's, they were awash in bronze and then their wealth really enhanced through this period. Um, this is a Kuba mass from the Kasai River area in Congo, in eastern Congo. And um, again, I'm, here are the emphasis is on the materials and even though, you know, cowrie shells are considered this very African <laughs> material, um, those are actually import goods. Okay, they come from off the coast of um, Portugal and um, other other areas, and so those were imported into the kingdoms. Now, the Kuba kingdom is far into the in the Congo interior, and so to receive to have access to this amount of cowrie shells and beads, of course, which also come from um, came from Eastern Europe and Italy. This is wealth, power, and access to trade, control of trade routes. So only the kingdoms, only the only royalty and nobles and elites could have access to these materials to enhance their appearance. Uh, this is a calm, a calm kingdom mask from the Cameron grass fields. Uh, this is a mask that last performed uh, at the Kingdom of Kham in 1976. Uh, it's covered with, with brass sheeting and it also has the, the beads on top. Now this is a mask that's on loan to, uh, a crown that's on loan to us. Um, this is from Ghana. It's from, it's a Khan. It, it's probably Fante. I don't think it's a, a, a Sante. Uh, but gold, yes, is an indigenous um, resource. However, the heraldic lions on the front are not. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> lions live in southern Africa. They don't live in Ghana. So this is actually, this is a, a motif that's, that Akan elites have adopted from the kind of Brit British heraldic tradition. And of course, we're aware of Brit the history of colonial history of Brit Britain in Ghana. But there, as you, if you, if we were in, the, there's also a cross. There are crosses on the far left, and then um, on either side there are fleur de lis. So they're drawing from all sorts of royal, regal sources, right? Um, this is one example. In the galleries, we have a couple of spaces for textile rotations and. In this royal arts section, we include, we will rotate a lot of um, West African strip woven cloth, especially Kente from Ghana. This is an Eve example. Now, Kente, which, you know, again, is one of the most popular um, textile traditions from West Africa. Americans have adopted it in many ways. It's popularized for being very colorful, but original kente was blue and white, it was indigo and white, cotton. So, for 
from local sources. And so with trade, when weavers got access to imported colorful silk textiles, they unraveled those silk textiles to get the colored threads and then reinterpreted them as kente. And so that's what created the kente that we, we, we love so much. I love kente. Um, so there's, there's all sorts of evidence of trade, contact, and global, global and cross-cultural interaction in artworks. And this is a, this is a subject matter that I really um, want our visitors to. Ivory, of course, a, and a precious material, con strictly controlled by kings and chiefs. Um, this is a very rare side-blown horn from Gabon. And this is a really beautiful little chokwe pipe fragment uh, from Angola. And you could just barely see it, but there are these little brass tacks that are adorning the crown of the figure. Those were import goods. Tobacco itself, which was smoked in the pipe, again, from the Americas. So chiefs and nobles had access to these elite goods. So the last theme addresses uh, coming of age, arts for coming of age, masks that come out um, at, the, at various stages in initiation ceremonies where adolescents, children and adolescents are removed from their communities for training by elders, initiated elders, and they are trained in the ways of adulthood, um, fam family and community histories, um, they're trained in you know, how to be successful spouses, uh, and then upon completing their initiations, they're considered adults, eligible, uh, eligible for marriage and eligible to be recognized by the communities as contributing adults. And so these masks come out at different stages. These are from um, Congo. Uh, I, this is an image on the right. Uh, um, showing that the masks appeared in pairs. Our mask you see is missing its glorious ruff. Um, and you see it's, it's a really sweet photo to see the children there. And we have this giant um, mask, Sachi Congo mask. It's this big. Um, that's a Mende mask from Sierra Leone. This is one of the few masks practices that we know where women are the perform are the masqueraders. The mask is still carved by a man, but the mask itself is performed by a woman by women. And these are relevant to a women's initiation society in Sierra Leone and Nigeria. That's a kwaba. So this is a this is a doll that um, so the the oral history the oral history is that um, a woman named Akua was having difficulty conceiving and she was advised by a ritual specialist to carve a, as a doll and carry it around on her back and uh, she was successful in, in conceiving and so it's recognized as a very important symbol for fertility. So the, um, the last section is dedicated to Yoruba art from, Niger from southwestern Nigeria. This is the strength of our collection. Um, this is the one area where we can show our visitors lots of examples from a single culture area. It's just chance. Um, also, the Yoruba make a lot of art because they're making <laughs> they're making the art for all of the gods and goddesses that they worship. So. Um, this is, these are just some examples. I'll just kind of scroll through so that we can have some discussion time. Yoruba art also has perhaps the most research done in um, identifying artists by name and by workshop and location. And this is really the work of art historians in the, in the 20th century. Uh, we don't have this kind of documentation for most of the other historical work because the, the people who collected the work in the 19th century or the early 20th century 
didn't bother to ask or to write it down. And we can talk about that if you want to. But um, So the, the section on Yoruba, is, on Yoruba art is devoted on one half to leadership arts, arts owned by elite individuals. These are sculptural posts that decorated the verandas of important individuals' homes, um, beaded, beaded works owned by chiefs and kings, um, an initiated society called Oboni. Um, these are sculptures that are in sig sculpture and textile that are insignia of these member society members. Divination, which is really the crux of Yoruba religion, and it is a practice that enables Yoruba um, Yoruba people, Yor Yoruba individuals to align with their destiny, with the destinies that the gods and ancestors have set forth for them. So things go down, get off track, go see the Babalawo, and it's time for a consult. And then, you know, then you can have some assistance and realigning, realign. So this, again, we have a very strong um, kind of Shango theme, the god of thunder and lightning, the patron god of twins, and um, childhood, uh, these works are all dedicated to Shango. These are twin memorial figures. On the far left is a Shango dance wand that would be held by a devotee of the god. So that's just a sampling of what's on view uh, and what, what our collection holds. I hope that you'll come and pay us a visit sometime. Um, you know, why do we do the work? Um, I believe very strongly that in the context of an encyclopedic art museum, I believe very much in leveling the playing field uh, in that the African art galleries should be, a, a, should just kind of have a certain unity with the other art, other art galleries in the museum. And so for that reason, I do privilege uh, displaying the works to the best effect in terms of highlighting their sculptural and formal achievements artistically. Um, that, and that's why um, we're, make, you know, we're changing the wall color in the galleries right now from orange to uh, gray, more neutral. Um, we're changing to LED lights. And you know other things like that. So why I'm bringing some things out from behind the glass to so really encourage our visitors to um, to look at these works uh, in the way that they look at everything else in the museum.